Church. Good evening, everyone. How are you today? Always fine. Everything will be fine in your life. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your servants, your ministers. Thank you, Lord, for the leaders. We're asking you, Lord, without exception, you touch and transform every life in this process of development and training in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray the excitement and the joy of serving you will remain in every life, every minister in Jesus' name. We will not be weary. We will not be tired. And I pray, Lord, day by day, you continue to increase your people in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the headquarters church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. We're coming to Daniel chapter 11. In Daniel chapter 11, we're reading from verse 32. Daniel 11, verse 32. And such as do wickedly, Against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and they will do exploits. At the time of the great tribulation, the Antichrist will come and in particular concentrate on the people of Israel. He will try to change the law. And change the times. It will try to corrupt the covenant that Israel has had with the Almighty God. And the people that do wickedly, that abandon the word of God, abandon the way of God, abandon the will of God, they'll be deceived by the flatteries of the Antichrist. And they will become corrupt. He will corrupt them by flatteries. And then it says, even at such a time, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If that will happen at the time of the Great Revelation, think about our own day. The Great Revelation is not here yet. There are troubles, yes. Temptations, yes. Trials, yes. Difficulties, yes. There is corruption, yes. But even in the midst of these problems, there will be people that will know they are God. And you will be one of those people, you will really know God. And it says, you will be strong, I see you strong. And you will do exploits in Jesus' name. We've been going through a series on the development of leaders, leadership. We've gone through L, E, A, D, and now we come to E. I'm talking to you tonight on the enduring exploits of selfless, godly leadership. Leadership that is godly. Leadership that is selfless. Leadership that wants to do everything God has raised him up for to do. And leadership that will then endure and do exploits. This is our time. And whatever the challenge around us, whatever the challenge in the communities in which we live, will be strong. And we're going to do exploits in Jesus' name. You see, there are people, they do not understand that at the time of problem, at the time of uh, testing, uh, at the time of difficulty, it's the time to show their strength. You, don't, you can't show strength when everything is easy, and when everybody is easy going, and when there is no trial, when there is no testing, when there is uh, no problem. How can you show strength at that time? The person who shows strength, 
the person who shows uh, courage is the person that's able to move on and push on while those dangers and difficulties are there. And the early church experienced that, you understand? The persecution at the time of the early church. And yet look at the testimony we have concerning them. Acts chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 6. Acts chapter 17, verse 6. It says, and when they found them not... They drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, look at this, these that turned the world upside down are come hither also. The people were afraid of the apostles. They were afraid of the preachers. They were afraid of the evangelists. They were afraid of the people that came preaching the word of God and they came with power. They came with anointing. They came with authority. Even before they started preaching, even before they started doing anything, the people cried out and said, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. You'll be one of those people. Nothing will intimidate you. Nothing will terrify you. You'll be part of the people that God will use as great instrument. You will turn the world around your right side up in Jesus' name. Look at verse 16 here. And now while Paul waited for them, at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. And you know, if you're going to do exploits, it, there must come to a time when your spirit is not dull, your spirit is not dead, your spirit is not dormant, your spirit is not downtrodden, your spirit is not backward, your spirit is not cold, your spirit is not lukewarm. There is something that happens that as you see your community, it says your spirit is stirred up. Your spirit will be stirred up. And the gifts in you will be stirred up in Jesus' name. But you know somebody is always looking down and is always walking as if there's no strength, there's no spine. There's no backbone. Any little wind will make him, uh, you know, just hands down as if we cannot do anything. When he prays, the prayer is dull. When he preaches, the preaching is dull. When he shares the word, the sharing is dull. Everything is down and dull. If your spirit is not stirred up, you will not wake up to do something. Why did those apostles and those disciples, why did they do something? How is it that they rose up and they were militant in the carrying out of the assignment the Lord has given them? Here is the secret. Look at verse 16 again now. While Paul waited at, at, for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. He saw them giving to idolatry and yes, Christ has died. And Christ uh, paid for their sin. And Christ wanted to save them. He wanted to turn them around in the right direction. But they were wholly, completely, entirely, wholeheartedly giving to idolatry. Therefore, he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. And in the market daily were them that met with him. He wasn't waiting for a convenient time. He wasn't waiting for a better time. Every day, every day, every day, he disputed with them. He was talking to them. What was he saying to them? Look at Bastachi. In Bastachi, and the times of this ignorance, God winged at. But now commanded all men, idol worshippers, all men, sinful people, all men, depraved people, all men, religious people. Now he has commanded all men everywhere to repent. What should they repent? What if they did not repent? What will happen if they didn't repent? Verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. 
and look at Second Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, if you are going to do exploits, your spirit is stirred up, you know the Lord your God, you are strong, and then you can do exploits. But more than that, your spirit is a wicked, your spirit is alive, and you are to learn, you are not sleeping, you are not dozing, you are not dumb, and you are not dead, and you are not spiritually totally destroyed. You are awakened. You will wake up. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, my, my grace is sufficient for thee. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. Actually, Paul had a challenge. The challenge of persecution. The challenge of oppression. And the challenge he had made him to go to God and he prayed. And he prayed again. And he prayed again. The pressure was too much. The buffeting was too much. And he sought the Lord thrice that it might depart from him. And the Lord said, I'll make you stronger than your problem. I'll make you higher than your mountain. I make you more powerful than your enemies. And he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you think you are weak, you become strong. When you think you cannot, you will in the mighty name of Jesus. It says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in wisdom in um, is made perfect in weakness look at verse 12 now it says truly after i received that grace truly after i went into that grace truly i dived into the grace truly i received i embraced the grace of god he said truly as i look at it now persecution did not decrease what i could have done and intimidation did not decrease what I could have done. Problems and pressures did not decrease what I should have done. Persecutors did not decrease what I should have done. With all those trials and troubles and persecution, persecutors, he said, truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, and his signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Look at what is going to happen in your life. That signs will come upon your life. And then not only that, perseverance. You will persevere. You will not get tired. The devil will do something and then he will think, next week I will not find him there. Next week I will not find that there. Because I have done enough to subdue him and to destroy him and to run him out of ministry and lo and behold he comes to check up the following week you're even stronger than the previous week now and you're still there i said you're still there you'll be there even while the devil is checking up the devil will say there's no point running after this one he never gives up you will never give up and truly the signs of an apostle what done, what wrought among you in all patience and in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. God will use you to perfect the church. I say God will use you to perfect the church. Let the brother say, Amen. Amen. Sister, the grace of God will increase in your life. The Spirit of God will move mightily in your life. Sisters, the Lord will use you to perfect his church in Jesus' name. Look at verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, I also labor. You know what he's saying? I don't just say, Timothy, go and labor. Titus, go and labor. 
Epaphroditus go and labor, and Epaphras go and labor, Aquila, Priscilla, our son, you there go and labor, and then he sits him back at home. He said, No, I also labor. I know some leaders, and thank God they are not leaders who are here, but somewhere there, they relax, they sit back, they take the back bench, and then they are telling them, You go and evangelize, you go and pray, you go and counsel. You go and lead, you go and hold the service, you go and teach, and they do nothing. They do nothing because they do not have the spirit, the mind, the energy, the power, and the pursuit of a person like Paul. But he said, Whereunto I also labor, your labor, striving according to his walking, which walketh in me. My chili, walketh in me, my chili. Tonight, you are looking at the message The Enduring Exploits of Selfless Godly Leadership. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the endowment and consecration of uncommon leaders. You know, when you're a leader, but you're a so so leader, you're an ordinary leader, you're like every, every other person, you do not distinguish yourself. And people do not know that as for that leader, this is the sterling quality of his life, of his ministry, that makes him uncommon. That's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to be uncommon leaders. Uncommon in your approach. Uncommon in your dedication. Uncommon in your giving yourself fully and completely to what needs to be done. The endearment and consecration of uncommon leaders. Point number two, the examples and characteristics of uncompromising leaders. The examples and characteristics of uncompromising leaders. You know, we have a lot of leaders around us. And there are some leaders that they are called and they think out of the platform of their coldness. They are sluggish, and they think out of the platform of their sluggishness. They are reserved. They are thinking, why should we do this? Why should we do this? There are other people that can do it. And they speak out of their reservation. They are backward. And when they talk, and when they think, they talk and think in line with their backwardness. And when they come to you, they say, we are the same in the same church. And we're leaders together. But understand, they're speaking from their own background. And if you're not going to be as cold as they are, as lukewarm as they are, as lethargic as they are, as a beating down, beating back as they are, you need to know when to say no. And those who are able to say no to those who are cold, those who are lethargic, and those who are lukewarm, and those who are thinking of themselves instead of thinking of the progress of the church, when they come to you and they talk to you, you have to be uncompromising. And then you say no. Point number two, the examples and the characteristics of uncompromising leaders. Point number three, the earnestness and courage of unconquerable leaders. You'll be unconquerable. Amen. The power to remain unconquerable. The energy to remain unconquerable. The passion within you to remain unconquerable. The Lord will distribute to everyone. You will have your part. The earnestness and courage of unconquerable leaders. We're looking at point number one. It's endowment and consecration of uncommon leaders. We're coming to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 24. Reading from verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. I send the promise of my Father upon you. That's the promise he made. 
That's the understanding we have. That when he goes to heaven, he will not forget us here on earth. He will know he has given us a commission. He has given us a work. And he has given us a work to do at such a difficult time. In times like these. And he knows we cannot do the work effectively without sending us the power. And he says, behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued, enveloped, immersed, and dipped, and submerged with power from on high. That means the power he is sending will be in your heart, will be upon your head, will come out of your mouth will submerge you and surround you that no weakness will remain in any part of your life in Jesus' name. When that happens, look at what will happen. The result, Micah, chapter 3, Micah, chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 8. Micah, chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But truly, it said, I have a testimony, and it's true. I have a testimony. There's something bubbling inside me. Truly, there's no shadow of doubt in this. I feel it in my soul. I feel it in my spirit. He said, truly, every time I go out to any community of the people of Israel, there is something inside there. Truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. This was the Old Testament. And now we're going to have something greater than the Old Testament. We'll be endued with power. We'll be enveloped with power. We'll be saturated with power. That we can say more than Micah, truly, I am full of the power of the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. You will not be backward. When it comes your time anywhere to declare the truth of the word of God in your regular church or in the community where you live, the power of God will move you. The power of God will drive you. And that's a kind of spirit that wants to say, why don't you sit down? Why don't you sit down? You will rise up like a giant. Because the power of God resides and abides in you. And look at what Micah said, I'm full of the power of the Spirit of the Lord. That's exactly what the Lord has promised you and promised me and promised all of us. We will have power. I will have power. Now, what, what, what do you think? If you have the power and you have the, the unction and you have the anointing and now the time comes for you to rise up and do what the Lord wants you to do, the reason he gave you the power and it's at that time you say, um, yes, I'll do it another time. I will think of another time. And you're postponing and you're procrastinating. You will not procrastinate. This is your hour. The hour of your power. And the Lord is going to make you demonstrate that power without being reticent and without looking back, without falling back, lying, follow in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 1, we're reading from verse 8. It says in verse 8, but you shall receive power. Who is he talking to? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's why they said crucify him. Jerusalem, that's the place where they rejected Jesus. Jerusalem, that's the place they were spiritually blind. And now Jesus said, you will receive power. In that same place they rejected him. You will go there, they will accept Christ. 
in that same place where other people have preached, in that same place where other people have labored. And he said, no, we have a religion. No, we have uh, our idolatry. No, we have this and we have that. And they said, you don't want Christ. You'll go back to that same place. And the power of the Lord will work mightily in your life in Jesus' name. It says, you'll receive power and you'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. You will not run away from the villages. Uttermost part of the earth, you will do what needs to be done and this work will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. We are coming to First Corinthians, we are coming to Romans rather, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, Paul did it, you'll do it. The apostles did it, we will do it. This is your time. And you will be strong, you will do exploits in Jesus' name. With what power, with what authority. Look at Romans chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Through, the, through mighty signs... And wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. It says it's not, it's not my innate ability. It's not my natural ability. It's not my constitution. It's not my background. You know, some people will say, well, that's Paul. That's his constitution. I'm not like him. That's Paul. That's his upbringing. I'm not like him. That's Paul. That's his native, normal, natural courage. I'm not like him. He said, no, it's not natural courage. It's not natural ability. It's not native knowledge. It is not anything that's of my natural constitution. He said, it is through the mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. That same Spirit of God will walk in your life. So that from Jerusalem, around the bout Illyricum, I have fully, I have completely, I have wholeheartedly, I have in a consecrated manner, in a concentrated manner, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I pray it will happen to you. They had the endowment of power, but they also had consecration on common leaders have the power, they also have consecration. You see, there are people that may have some power, some ability, some skill, some knowledge, but they don't join, attach consecration with their skill. They know a lot. They can tell a lot. And when they're discussing privately, they can say, you know, I have this, I have this, I have this. Why don't you use it? Well, I just don't, uh, you know, want to expose myself. I don't want to do anything at this time. I don't want to push myself forward. And, uh, well, but I know I have the knowledge. If I wanted to, I could erase this term. But there's no consecration. But you know the apostles, you know the disciples, they had endowment of power and they had consecration to make use of what they had. I pray God will help you. You will join consecration to your skill in Jesus' name. Consecration to your knowledge in Jesus' name. How many people in our church have knowledge, understanding? They may come into our church for five years, seven years, ten years. If you ask them any question privately about salvation, they'll, they'll tell you sanctification they'll open the bible to you privately if you ask them about the power in the holy ghost they know where it is in the bible if you ask them about one man one wife they will tell you look at matthew now and look at this other one now but they're not working for god they're not serving the lord they're just there they're on the shelf it's like, you know, that good book you have, always on the shelf. You never touch it. You never open it. How many books do you have? How many Bibles do you have? And they're just on the shelf there. And every Bible you have contains power. 
Every word of God you find there contains power. But they will not take it out of the shell. The same thing, there are some so-called brothers, they are on the shell. They are in the cola. They have knowledge, they are in the cola. Sisters there are, they have knowledge, they are in the cola. They are on the shell. I will not be on the shell. I will come out. And I will declare the word of God in Jesus' name. You will. I said you will. You will not be on the shelf. You know, sometimes when you are trying to, you know, clean up things in your room, and then you get to those books that you have not, you have not taken up or touched, or touched in one year, the dust is all over it. Look at that Bible. The dust is all over it. And you... When you're on the shelf like that, that's what the cockroaches were on over the man on the shell. That's how the rice, the rats will be eating part of the leg. It's, it's always there. It's on the shell. That's why the doors will be uh, on that person because it's always on the shell. You will arise. But when somebody is moving, cockroaches cannot just jump over you when you're on the go. And all those birds will not be putting their nests and their ways upon your head. When you're on the go, you will be on the go. I said you'll be on the go. Okay, let me talk for myself. I will be on the go. You'll be on the go. And the world will know an army of children of God. They are breathing up and we're going to do something. You will do something. I said you will do something. Look at Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 1. Awake, awake. It says awake. But sometimes, you know, the alarm clock rings for the first time. And then you say, let me sleep more. Let me sleep more. But that same alarm clock rings five minutes after, the second time. And then it's far away from you. It's not where you can touch it and just put it up. And it keeps on ringing and keeps on ringing. This word awake will keep on ringing in your ears. And when it rings and rings and rings again, you will rise up. I see you rising up. I see you consecrated to the Lord. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garment, so Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth, from now on, there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. But still, shake thyself from the doors. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself. From the hands of the of, on, of, from the from the hands on that bands on thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion, nothing will hold you down. Consecrated, we're moving on. Consecrated, we're going to preach. Consecrated, we're going to do the will of God, and this work will prosper in your hand, in our hands together, in Jesus' name. Headquarters, Amen. Point number two now, the examples and characteristics of uncompromising leaders. Examples and characteristics of uncompromising leaders. Uh, let, let's start with Moses. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, I want to remind you that when uh, Moses was born, there were difficulties in the land. And when Moses was being raised up, there was oppression upon the children of Israel. And then he had an opportunity to escape all that trouble and to escape all that pressure and to escape all the destruction of life that was going on in his own time. But he said, I'm going to be an example, and I'm going to show the characteristics of an uncommon, uncompromising leader. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And you know what he was giving up? Because being the son 
of Pharaoh's daughter, if the Pharaoh on siege, on the throne, um, you know, died, he will be the next one. He'll be a king over Egypt. But he said, no, I don't want that. I'm going to identify with the people of God. And there are some people here that the people of the world, the Egypt of our time, is beckoning on you. You know what you can become? Instead of being a preacher in that your church, instead of being a leader in that your church, instead of Sunday you are there, Monday you are there, Tuesday you are there, Thursday you are there, all the days are gone, and we could make you somebody. The Almighty God will make you somebody. And you will be like most, you'll be uncompromising. I have a call upon my life. And I have the assignment the Lord has given me. That assignment the Lord has given you, you will do it. Nothing will distract you in Jesus' name. You know, being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, you'll have the best of food the best of accommodation, the best of transportation, the best of care, the best of royalty. But he said, no, I have something better. What can you have, Moses? Better than this? Egypt was the number one country in the world at that time. And you are going to be the number one person, number one citizen, in the number one country in the whole world. He said, there's something greater than that. What's that? The nation of Israel. They are in darkness. The nation of Israel, they are under captivity. The nation of Israel, they have this oppression upon them. He knew that God has raised him up to deliver that nation and to make them a mouthpiece for God. Not only that, he was going to be the writer of the first five books of the Bible. And that will give knowledge to the whole world. Not only that, was going to preserve the nation of Israel in the land of liberty, in the land of promise. And those people were write the rest of the Bible. He said, that's something greater that will influence the whole of the world. I pray God will open your eyes. That all the things the people of Egypt and the people of the world are offering to you, they are nothing to be compared with what you are going to have. You are going to have something you never imagined in your life. Your life is going to be great. Look at verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. You say, Moses, I don't understand. How, come, how you can make such a choice? He said, have you noticed our mothers... They know that when they get pregnant, they're going to have pain. And when they're going to deliver, they're going to have pain. And it's a form of suffering. It's almost sometimes almost going to be unbearable. And yet they choose to still have a child. And look at Anna praying and praying. I want a son. I want a son. Anna, do you know what you are praying for? Do you know that as you are free, no pregnancy and no child, you are escaping pain and you are escaping suffering? You say, yes, I know. I want that suffering. It's the kind of suffering that will produce a militant and an uncompromising prophet for the nation of Israel because they're looking at what their effort will produce. That's why they chose to rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. You will not be afraid of suffering with the people of God. It's temporary. It's temporary. And whatever the suffering, it will never go beyond your strength. It will never go beyond your ability. That thing will be under your feet. You will succeed in spite of the suffering. In spite of the suffering, you're going to have a breakthrough in Jesus' name. And when that child is born, then the pain is gone. 
and the, and the child becomes a president, and the child becomes a doctor, and the child becomes a lecturer, and the child becomes a professor, and the child becomes a deliverer to deliver the people of Israel out of captivity. You will not shun that little suffering. Choosing rather to suffer affliction for the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. For he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. If he had not chosen that, think of what will happen. He will not have the power to bring water out of the rock. If he had not chosen that, and he said, I'll be in Israel, I'll be in, I'll be in Egypt, and I'm going to be in the royal family, he will not have the power that his, his rod, serpent, will swallow up all the serpents of the magicians. If he had not had that uh, choice, he will not have the privilege of bringing manna for about two, about a two and a half millions of people, three millions of people in the wilderness. He will not have be able to divide the Red Sea. He would not have appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration if he had said, I'm preserving my life. I don't want trouble. I don't want, uh, you know, all this harassment of the Egyptian people. And I'm lucky. And they want to make me, um, you know, a, a king uh, over Egypt. All those things they will miss. And then when you come to Revelation, you have the name of Moses coming up. All that it will miss. I pray you will not miss your promotion. What God wants to do through you, a little challenge now, will not make you lose it in Jesus' name. Look at, look at verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Actually, Moses, looking ahead, saw the invisible. It's all those uh, slaves, all those Israelites being oppressed now. He saw them getting up invisible. He saw them moving out invisible. He saw them uh, all being enriched. He saw them strong. He saw them at the Red Sea in the future. He saw the Red Sea being parted. He saw the great miracle power he's going to have. He saw the Almighty, the invisible one, by his side, helping him all the time. He saw far beyond the temporary and the temporal as if he saw the invisible. God will open your eyes. You will see the invisible in Jesus' name. Uncompromising, uncompromising leader. Eventually, um, Pharaoh called him and said, All right, Moses, let's, let's bring this thing to a conclusion. It's drawing long for a long time. You can go, but now tell me before you go, how many of you are going? And before Moses had a chance to answer that question, he said, A man will go, a woman will go, our children will go, and everything we have. Pharaoh said, Moses, let's, let's, let's reach a compromise. I'm, I'm moving a little towards you. You move a little towards me. Leave all your cattle, leave everything behind. But you can go and worship the Lord. The language of an uncompromising leader is said, Pharaoh, not a hoof are we going to leave behind. Everyone, everything will go. Your whole family must get to heaven. Your friends must get to heaven. The members of the church must get to heaven. No negotiation with the enemy. No negotiation with Satan. That can't you leave your husband behind? No. Can't you leave your wife behind? No. Can't you leave your children behind? No. Can you leave some of these, um, you know, members of the church? They're not up and doing. Uh, they're not uh, fast. And they're not receptive. Uh, can't you leave them behind? That, that's their choice. And let them go to hell? No. Not a hoof are we going to leave behind. Everyone will go with us. I said everyone will go with us. We will stand. You will stand. I said you will stand. 
the amen is too cold for me. Look at Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. This is an example. And this is the characteristic of an uncompromising leader. We're coming to Daniel chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 8. It says, But Daniel purposed in his heart. That's where it starts. It's not just in the head. I know I must not be compromising, but it's deep in your heart. It mixes with your emotion. It mixes with your affection. It mixes with your decision. It mixes with your pursuit. It mixes with your passion that you say, I am going to stand out as a real leader. I'm going to stand out as a pastor. I'm going to stand out as a youth leader. I'm going to stand out as a woman leader. I'm going to stand out on the campus. I'm going to stand out among the children workers and I'm going to take a stand. You purpose each in your heart. And you do that before the temptation comes. You do that before the challenge comes. You do that while you're praying, while you're reading the Bible. And you see that there may come a challenge that will tell you to tone down a little bit, slow down a little bit. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. No, with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the priests of the eunuchs that he would not defile himself. You know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they will be thrown into the, into the furnace of fire. But he said, Nebuchadnezzar, never mind. We have made up our minds. We are going to serve the Lord. And the God of heaven, him only are we going to serve. Nebuchadnezzar said, Watch it. Think it over. You are young people. Because when I decide to throw anyone in the fire, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, nothing to worry about. What did I say? In your life, your community when they threaten you nothing to worry about make your fire and he, he was angry you know some people cannot bear the anger of those people in the world those who say they are angry at you when they see the miracle of God preservation they will turn around and they will honor you and so he was, he was angry he threw them into the fire said I'll teach them a lesson. No other Israelite in this kingdom will stand face to face with me and say, they will not worship my idol. Why is that God? I conquered them. I brought them out of their land and they're here. And he threw them into the fire. And then he just stood up. He wanted to see actually how they have been burnt to ashes. And he peeped. What did he say? Four people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who is the final one? The son of God, Jesus. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. When you take your stand, this fire of the world will not burn you. And the water of this world will not drown you in Jesus' name. You know, Daniel... And he said, nobody must pray to any God, anywhere, throughout this month. Daniel, you've heard, if you pray to God this month, only 30 days, you'll be thrown into the lion's den. Why don't you just backslide for 30 days? And then you tell God, you apologize, you pray to God, oh God, I've done it. I've not prayed because of the lions. How do we have the miracles we have in the Bible if the people were compromising? But eventually, after Daniel knew they had signed that decree, he opened his window. That's what he always did. He knelt down. That's what he always did. And he prayed to the God of heaven. 
and the people were waiting for him to do that. They said, we saw him. We saw him. And he went to report to the king. And the king wanted to deliver him, but he could not understand. It's the law of the Medes and the Persians that will never change. And eventually they threw him into the lion's den. The lions were waiting to be the cushion and to be the soft bed on which they would lie. And when he got there all through the night, he had a good night's sleep. No worry, no anxiety, no palpitation of the heart, and there's nothing that will shake you until you finish your work, you remain alive in Jesus' name. And the king who was in the palace could not sleep, the man who was in the lion's den was asleep, sound asleep. Early in the morning, he came and he said, Daniel, servant of the Most High God, is your God whom you serve day and night able to deliver you? And Daniel said, King, I'm putting my words now, good morning. Things are fine over here. Everywhere here is cool. The Lord sent his angel, and he closed and shut the mouth of the lions. They, can't, they could not hurt me. And now the king said, let me see you. Come out. And then he came out, and there was no scratch on his body. And then the king said, the people that said Daniel should get into the lion's den, let them also spend a night there in the lion's den. And let's see what will happen to them. And you know, some people would have said, when Daniel was there, the lions were not hungry. That's why nothing happened. They were hungry. I said they were hungry. But they're not hungry for your blood. Because your blood will be poison to them. And so they threw all those people there. And as they were getting there, they were all destroyed and their bones were cracked. God was stand by the uncompromising leader. He was sent by you. I said he was sent by you. Nothing will hurt you. Nothing will destroy you. Say the amen that will make it possible. Point number three now. The earnestness and the courage of unconquerable leaders. The earnestness and the courage of unconquerable leaders. The people who know they will not be conquered and God has given them a work and assignment to do. They are earnest. They are not sluggish. They are not slow. They are not redundant. They are not warming the bench. They are not sitting down all the time without standing up. They are active, and they are powerful, passionate. The Lord will give us that earnestness in Jesus' name. Look at, um, look at Jude chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 3. Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that he should, how? That he should tell me, that you should shout it out, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Earnestly, earnestly, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 1, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed. The more earnest heed. Everything we've been hearing about the work of God, about the great commission the Lord has given us, not to do it with a loose hand. We've been doing it for all these many years. Then we we'll rise up as if we're going to fall back into bed, and then we're we'll walking sluggishly. And we're we'll they say, "What are you going to do?" We are going to evangelize. Today is our evangelism day, and uh, they say we should. They say, they say, 
How about you yourself? How about your own earnestness and your passion? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we shall let them sleep. They will not sleep away from you. I said they will not sleep away from you. Uh, you, you know the sinners in our community? You know they commit sin? You know the criminals in our community? You know they commit crime? Let me show you. Let me show you in Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. See how those uh, people work. The average person in the world, you know how they go about their business? And the sinful people in the world, you know how they go about their sin? Let me show you. It tells us in verse 3. Micah chapter 7 verse 3. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly. Those who commit sin, they do it earnestly. Those who commit crime, they do it earnestly. Those who kind of oppress other people, they do it earnestly. Those who do evil, those people with both of their hands, not one hand in the pocket, and then using the other hand to commit crime, their whole heart, their whole mind, their whole energy, they all understand it. Everything they have ever learned, they bring into the, into the evil they're doing, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for reward, and the great man he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap each up, they wrap each up earnestness in the people of the world and they are courageous they're doing something that can endanger their lives they're courageous they're doing something that can uh, snuff out life out of them they're courageous the lord wants you and i to have the same earnestness look at joshua chapter one joshua chapter one look at verse six joshua chapter one i'm reading from verse six be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people, thou, God is not going to replace you with another person. Thou, even you, yourself, thou shall divide for an inheritance the, the land which I have, which I, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Only be thou strong and very courageous. All the courage you need, the Lord will give you. Uh, but you understand, you understand, while you're sleeping on the bed, you don't feel the courage. While you are behind and backward, you don't feel the courage. While you are idle, you don't feel the courage. We don't feel courage until we get up. Until we're on the field, until we open our mouths, until we raise our hand, until we begin to pray. We don't feel the faith, you don't feel it, you don't feel the confidence, you don't feel it, you don't feel anything at all. It is when you rise up and then you go to do it, all of a sudden you know you have courage. You will have courage. I said you will have courage. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left hand that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. You'll prosper everywhere you go. You go to teach, it will prosper. You go to preach, it will prosper. You go to evangelize, it will prosper. You go to pray for people, it will prosper. You go to counsel, everywhere, in everything you do, you are going to prosper. And your work with which you earn, your living, that work will prosper. 
verse 8 this book of the law shall not depart out of the out of your mouth the promises in the book should not depart out of your mouth the encouragement in the book should not depart out of your mouth the prophecies in the book should not depart out of your mouth the protection the preservation in the book will not depart out of your mouth the psalms in the book will not depart out of your mouth the confidence and the courage in the book will not depart out of your mouth every content everything in the book this book of the lord shall not depart from your mouth but thou shalt meditate 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 on the promises meditate on the precepts meditate on the prophecies and meditate on the power of the lord who has given us the promises thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then thou shalt have, what are you going to have? Thou shalt have, what are you going to have? Anywhere you turn to the right, to the right, thou shalt have. In the church and at home thou shalt have with your friends and in the midst of enemies thou shalt have the word of god will prevail whatever the people are planning whatever the people are doing will not prevail over your life thou shalt have good success in jesus name have not i commanded thee be strong and of a good courage be not afraid somebody there be not afraid Brother, sister, there be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Whithersoever thou goest. Whithersoever thou goest. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And I'm reading here from verse 32. Daniel chapter 11. We're reading from verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. The flatteries of the world will not catch me. The flatteries of the world will not catch you. Those who are corrupting the covenant of the Lord, you will not be a friend to them. They will not be your partner and they will not be your companion. But, here are my people, but, I said here are my people, but the people that do know their God, who is your companion? Who is your friend? Who is your partner in the work of the Lord? Who, are, who is your right hand man and your right hand woman that you are working with? It says they must be people that do know their God, they will be strong. When you are strong and your companion is strong, when you are strong and your friend is strong, when you are strong and the co-worker is strong, when you are strong and the co-evangelist is strong, and you are both strong together, lifting you up and you lifting him up, lifting you up and lifting her up, and you are lifting up each other, if two of you shall agree as touching anything that you will ask, the Lord will do it through you. It says, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. My time has come. I said my time has come. Our time has come. We're going to do exploits. In every street, in every community, in every street, in the village, in the town, we're going to do exploits and bring multitudes to the Lord in Jesus' name. Will you be of that number? The Lord counts you as part of the people that will be strong, that will do exploits in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord, O oh Lord, count me. O oh Lord, count me. When you count those who are serving, the Lord count me. When you count the people who are strong, O oh Lord, count me. When you count the people who are courageous, O oh Lord, count me. When you count the people who will take the light of the gospel and take it everywhere, count me. When you count the people that will do exploits for the kingdom at such a time like this, O oh Lord, count me. Let him count you tonight and be of the number. Open your mouth and pray and say, Lord, I'm available. I will do your work.